Happy Halloween! <laughs> it's August. Not even late August. Ever heard of a head start? I'm a busy person, school and shit. Head start? It's August, you dolt! Halloween's not for another three months! This joke has no punchline! The weirdest thing about talking about games like I do is when I touch on a game that was made by someone who's another much bigger personality than me. You all know Yahtzee of Zero Punctuation fame, right? The little white dude in the fedora that only sometimes has a face? One of the longest tenured, most prolific, and more than anything, most divisive critics in the world of gaming, but he's also known for various books and independent games. When it comes to the world of gaming, he's had a few major releases, including Hatfall and the Harrowing Consuming Shadow, but dating back to the 90s, he's released a bunch of freeware games games as a hobby, filled with homoerotic tension, cosmic horror, and men in shitty hats with parental issues. Make what you know, I suppose. In terms of freeware games, he's probably most well known for the Jizo Mythos, which consisted of 5 Days a Stranger, 7 Days a Skeptic, Trilby's Notes, 6 Days a Sacrifice, and tangentially Trilby Art of Theft, if only because it stars the same character. Also, it's the series that featured a character who looks suspiciously like Slenderman and came out years before. Curious. He's also had some lesser known titles like Poacher and Adventures in the Galaxy of Fantabulous Wonderment. <laughs> Both considered by some to be some of the best freeware games out there, but one I'm interested in is the lesser known episodic step platformer horror game 1213. Now isn't that a mouthful? Even more interesting is how it's an action game made at Adventure Game Studio, or AGS for short, so Yachts somehow managed to fit the hypothetical square peg into a round hole. Impressive, in the same way that it's impressive to eat an entire tree. Out of all the games featured on his Ego Review series, this one intrigued me the most because it was nihilistic, starts depressing and ends at depression bedrock, and overall is one of the better put together games out there narratively especially for freeware, all within the confines of a gameplay system that by all rights should not work. And seeing as it is Arbor Day after all, I figured it would be as good a day as I need to cover this game. By the way, those who get the joke of calling Halloween Arbor Day, you officially qualify for the TGX membership card. Otherwise, let's take a spoopy look at the spoopy game, 1213. Thankfully, this game is fairly easy to get running on modern hardware. It looked really fucky when I tried to run it raw, but compatibility mode with Windows XP does the trick, and there's even a few files that allow you to customize the game, which is good because OBS has a a stroke if you try and record games running full screen. So the game starts out with the titular protagonist 1213 in a cell covered in blood, and otherwise we know absolutely nothing about the current situation. This is one of the primary strengths that this game has going for it. It's very good at keeping you intrigued. It starts out by making you ask 15 questions, and by the time those questions are answered, 30 more have popped up, and it all builds around a single overarching point, which builds into the reveal and ending plot twist. But we get ahead of ourselves. Yahtzee has fully admitted that he didn't want gameplay to get in the way of the story, so that should indicate two things. The story is the primary focus focus in 12.13, and the gameplay was secondary from the very outset, and as such, the gameplay is somewhat clunky, even going beyond the engine limitations. As I mentioned, it's a step platformer like your Prince of Persia's or your flashbacks, and while the gameplay is serviceable, there are a bunch of problems. First of all, the controls are a wee bit all over the place. The movement controls are the arrow keys, fair enough, but the horizontal hop is space, shooting is tab, inventory is Q, and sprint is shift. It's a wee bit too spread out, and so things like trying to hop down holes and immediately start shooting was a wee bit awkward. Instead of giving you an ammo system and more skill-based shooting gameplay, you have unlimited ammo and you have a 50-50 chance of hitting your target. While I can see that this adds to the frantic, desperate, and most of all chaotic atmosphere of the game, it also makes every enemy encounter a coin toss if you take damage or not, and you can have an entire room of clearance between you and the creature with eyes on the prize, but if the RNG isn't in your favor, you can get fucked. But I will also say that the chosen sounds for shooting and whatnot are really effective. I think some of these sound effects can only be described as crunchy. But moving back to complaining, the hitbox is also really confusing. Like, when I climb up to avoid an attack, I'm not 100% sure when the game registers my character placement moving from one point to the next. This is especially apparent in the 0916 boss fight, when there were times when I clearly got out of the way of attacks that hit me, and clearly wasn't out of the way of attacks that did hit me. So that sucks. Practically every time I went to dodge a security droid by hopping up, I got hit anyway because there's no indication of timing or hit detection. Cleverly, your health is indicated by the speed of the beating heart at the top corner of the screen. To heal, you stand under a two-frame water sprinkler or shower, which is fairly synchronous with 1213's health being indicated by his heartbeat. It's less the damage being done to him and more him becoming more and more tense as things happen to him, leading to his heart exploding. Unless we're talking about a large fall, of course, and nothing eases tension like a nice cold shower. I remember back in 2016 while I was recovering from surgery, I was bored one night and decided against my better judgment to smoke an entire joint by myself. The resulting panic attack was probably the worst I've ever had. Two ice-cold showers later, I managed to calm myself down enough to sleep it off, so I can sympathize with 1213 here. Yeah, I smoke weed occasionally. It's legal here. 
fucking prudes. Healing in video games has never been realistic, so it's as good a method as any, and the tension of being one hit from death and scrambling to find a shower is palpable, nullified somewhat by the slightly frustrating RNG and the fact that you can quick save at any time. The platforming is fairly good. 1213 has a good weight to him, and the realistic feel adds a lot to the platforming. The only issue, once again, is the general hit detection. The specific spot I have to stand on to climb up is hard to gauge, especially when I'm in a rush, and so that got me hit several times. And the hit detection problems become very apparent in episode 2 when there's like this obstacle course with a bunch of electrical currents that you have to navigate, and it's super obnoxious because sometimes you just press up to try and grab onto a ledge, and it won't happen, and you take damage, and sometimes you just end up dying as a result. It could be a very cool section in theory, but it ended up being very obnoxious. Furthermore, the movement speed is very slow, which is understandable seeing as 1213 is a hunched over shell of a man or whatever he is. Thankfully, you do eventually get a limited sprint in episode 2, which speeds the game up tenfold. You also have the long jump when you sprint and jump, but that's never really used all that much. Also meaning that the first episode is probably the longest. There's three episodes in total, and you can tell that the interest was probably waning by episode 3, as the actual facility in episode 3 is pretty small compared to the first two episodes, but between the three episodes, you probably have two to two and a half hours worth of content, so you certainly get your lack of money's worth. The adventure game gimmick in 1213 is that you can only carry one item at a time, and you have to basically solve puzzles in the environment by using each item to get to the next item or whatever. The story being the major focus, many things like codes are locked behind text dumps that gradually piece together the sprawling puzzle that is the story, so this game is very tightly weaved around the narrative, which I appreciate. The puzzles are thankfully intuitive and straightforward. The worst it gets is having to fish out a keycard using a letter because it's long and thin. More Pajama Sam, less Leisure Suit Larry. The only issue is that the key items are always represented by generic black squares. I don't exactly have the best eyesight, but surely I can't be the only one who missed some of these items, because they are very easy to miss, particularly this one in the shower. It's a black spot in a busy background, so I spent some time trying to figure out how to operate this crane. There's a very infrequent stealth mechanic where you have to crouch in front of security cameras so a door won't close. It's slightly obnoxious and is used all of once outside of the tutorial because, as Yahtzee put it, he couldn't find anywhere to integrate it, but there's nothing to it other than having to move slower, so maybe the fact that it wasn't forced is a good thing. Oh yeah, there's also this secondary stealth mechanic where you have to, like, stand under broken lights to avoid security droids, which is really weird in the sense of, well, how can the security droids not see you just because it's slightly shady? I don't get it but whatever, artistic license. Finally, we have the bosses, which are uber obnoxious. The gameplay setup is too janky to have real fair boss fights. 0916 is an asshole because of the aforementioned hitbox issues, but then the way to tell which attack he's about to use is so nebulous, I'm not entirely convinced that there just isn't one. So if you don't get a few hits before he gets you once, then you're screwed. On both of my episode 1 attempts, it took me like 10 tries to win. It's not so unfair that you can't do it, but it's all based on luck. Then there's the Deadpool boss fight. Well, not really, you're fighting 1213's mental representation of Westbury. This one's easy because the arena's so big that you're given a week and a half to dodge projectiles, though the hit detection once again did screw me over, and finally you have to fight a giant security droid, which is super easy until the second droid comes in. You have to activate the nodes on this giant metal diagram of ovaries to damage the droid via three buttons, but you can cheese this boss fight basically by pausing the game because the droid exists outside of the game time. So when you take all of these elements together, pretty much everything has at least one issue, very par for the course in amateur development. The platform is the highlight. It's not the best, but for what it is, it gets the realistic nature of this genre down, so it's serviceable at worst, pretty decent at best, except for those times when I fell down a giant hole. <laughs> 1213, falling faster than my sanity. So gameplay-wise, this game is unremarkable to say the least, and the same can be said about the other parts of the game as well. The resolution is by default 320 by 200, and so on bigger displays it looks like the pixels are trying to kill you, and the text can be slightly hard to read at times as well. Some letters look similar, and so on. That said, the art style is pretty decent. The facility you're in actually feels like a real place that people work and live in, and while there's a bunch of oddly shaped areas, there's always an effort put in to make the uncanniness that other games might have be minimalized here. Lots of ladders and lifts to indicate ways for everyone else to get around, and the design is pretty neat. In the beginning, there's a lot of flat metallic colors with only the blood of fallen people and yellow tape to liven up the color palette, which really highlights the contrast and emphasizes the desolation of this space. This truly looks and feels like a dead environment, so it means all the more when you get into episode 2 and find yourself in the nicer, more colorful environments, only to find those areas to be hostile as well. The character sprite work starts out good given the resolution and peters off by episode 3. According to Yachts, the entire idea behind this game sprouted from the character design of 12 13, a hunched over man covered in blood with bandages all over his face, animating like he's in constant pain, and holding a gun close to his body like it's his only lifeline. The design is pretty badass, if slightly ripped off from second sight, and the similar design of the children is also pretty good. Is this what 1213 looks like under his bandages? Is this what 1213 is, or is he a human in a horrible situation? Who knows? 
At first, anyway. My theory is that he looks like Michael Moore. So the sprite work is good, but by the third episode, when the effort runs out, most of the enemies end up just being large floating security droids that don't animate. So this game could look a whole lot better, but it could also look a whole lot worse given the resolution. That said, the main character design is what really matters, as he's the one you're going to be seeing most of the time anyway, and he looks really cool. There are a few jarring art style changes, but that doesn't really matter. As was fully admitted by Yahtzee, the story was the central focus, and so this game was made or broken by this aspect, and let me tell you, this might be one of the most well-executed stories that he's ever made. So while 1213 is the playable character, he's not really the protagonist. The real protagonist is the scientist, Westbury. Isn't that where John Cena grew up? As he's the one who drives the plot and who the plot revolves around, where 1213 is more reactionary. He's the vessel by which the story takes place and advances, rather than an active participant in the events himself. Westbury is a scientist who had his brain illegally augmented as a child. He was once a notorious hacker, but ended up turning all of his hacker friends in and eventually found his way into science. Bioengineering specifically, he was the person spearheading this cloning project that 1213 resulted from, Project GFG, or Germ-Free Generation. The cloning was at first for rich businessmen so they could have compatible organs ready for when their health starts failing, but that was quickly cancelled as Project Germ-Free Generation was started, which is an ironic name seeing as most of the clones succumb to a disease. Through the various text dumps in the game, it paints a picture of Westbury slowly losing his mind over the year or so that this project was taking place, resulting in this little gem. Nice, nice. There's also a mystery surrounding Project GFG and Westbury, a mystery that we're given clues to throughout the game, a mystery so grand that it made Westbury's assistant, Deacon, commit suicide. He sent out a memo that was later redacted, but the memo is the reason why you occasionally come across people who have also committed suicide throughout the game. What is this big mystery? What is going on? It's a mystery thriller that keeps you guessing throughout the entire game, and as you go through the game, there are more and more details that seep in subliminally as the mystery begins to unfold. It turns out that we're not even on Earth, but rather a space station. All contact with Earth was cut off, and any attempts at contact, such as with letters to home, were thrown into the incinerator, a mysterious mission that Westbury is insistent on, and so on. Westbury puts 1213 through daily exercises to make sure he's fit enough to go on this nebulous mission that we know nothing about at first, but it's also implied that he gets a sick, perverse glee from tormenting 1213, and the reason for that is kind of complicated. So what 1213 is, is a clone, created in Section 12, Pod 13, the implication being that there have been over a hundred clones, right? While well, those yellow-skinned freaks you come across, well, they're other clones. They're your brothers and sisters. When they created the children, they inadvertently created a breeding ground for a hyper-infective virus that only affects the children called the Yellow Death. Those who didn't die were permanently mutated into mindless, brittle-boned beasts saved for three, 0916, 1108, and 1213. And in 0916's case, it's a little bit debatable. 0916 mutated into an absolute monster, 1108's mutations made him super intelligent, but he died before they could get him a vaccine, and 1213 was stabilized before he was mutated. Because of Westbury's mental augmentation, he found 1108 to be a kindred spirit, almost a son, because the illness basically did the same thing to 1108 that happened to him, but the process of creating a vaccine and testing it took too long, and 1108 died, leaving only 1213. That's why he torments 1213, because 1213 is the disappointing consolation prize that everything hinges on. I can sympathize. All of this can be found out by reading the various text dumps in the game, of which there are many. If you don't like to read, this isn't the game for you. It's also presented very Tell Don't Show style because most of these events have already happened, but if you can put up with these two issues, this is all very gripping stuff. Symbolism is also a big thing in this game. The most reoccurring symbolism you see in this game are two circles side by side. I did have the creator commentary on for the first episode, but I found that it slowed the game down significantly and turned it off thereafter, so some of the symbolism may have been lost on me. That said, the two circles are meant to represent Westbury's watchful eyes. As you may have noticed, Westbury's portrait is that of a silhouette with glowing eyes, which is meant to impose that he's an ominous yet mysterious figure, but the two circles motif is meant to symbolize that he's always looming, always watching, which is demonstrated several times throughout the story when Westbury appears before 1213 on the TV, or is shown that he's spying on 1213 and demonstrates that he's several steps ahead of him, always. Most of all with the O'Hagan situation. In episode 2, 1213 is recruited by one of the scientists who worked on Project GFG named O'Hagan. Among other things, she was in charge of educating the children, and her motherly nature made her a paternal figure for the children. So much so, seeing her classroom was one of the few things to break through 1213's memory, but she wanted to show that Westbury had lost it, and so when she recruited 1213 to take him down, Westbury was three steps ahead and ended up killing O'Hagan before she could do anything, leading to an angry 1213 snapping in the food court and fighting off the mental representation of Westbury, basically a glorified fuck you dad, you killed mum boss fight. So the big theme surrounding Westbury is omnipresent. He's so obsessed with getting 1213 approved for this nebulous 
nebulous mission that he's become a looming figure in tune with anything and everything in the station because he's that obsessed with getting his way. The symbolism also displays that he's lost it, such as in the 0916 cell where there's a streak of blood that bisects the TV that Westbury appears on, which represents the split, the duality of Westbury. Like I said, I only had commentary on for the first episode, and so there was probably a bunch of stuff that I missed, so if you play through this game, there'll probably be a whole bunch of stuff that you would notice that I didn't, and good symbolism has many interpretations. Now on the topic of 0916, he's probably the reason why episode 1 is so effective. As you blow your way past a makeshift furniture barricade into the Forbidden Zone underground using a makeshift bomb from 1108 cell, you start to make your way through and you start to notice that all these dead guards look like they died in a big struggle, and the description of many of these interactable objects indicate that there was a struggle. Then at one point, it's noted that many of the guards look like they were impaled. What's going on here? Then you see him. 0916. Pikachu's disgusting cousin? He's described as a monster, and there's no better word in my opinion than that. When the Yellow Death reached the mutation stage for 0916, it allowed him to start rearranging his skeleton at will, and then once he became unstable, there was no stopping him. But after the first time you see him, you make your way back to his cell, you think to fight him, but then he's missing. Spoopy. But then as you make your way back to the elevator you just picked up the key for, there's an eerie silence, and then... Everyone is gone. Mutant and guard alike. It's genuinely one of the most sudden, tense, and effective sequences in the entire game, especially when it goes for just long enough for you to think that you weren't going to see 0916 again, and then the music really sells this as well. Even though most of the music in this game is poorly looped and stolen from third parties, the eerie silence in this area of the game, only for the creepy music to pick up once you get out of the Forbidden Zone again with everybody gone, really adds to the holy shit feel of that moment. Unfortunately, the game never really gets back to this level. From that point on, it can be tense, but the unnerving feeling of going through the Forbidden Zone and going back with everything disappearing appearing is the apex of the game in terms of what this game sets out to be, and even the background storytelling elements in this game are depressing and slightly eerie. There's this text dump in this private area that was a journal entry written in the middle of the Forbidden Zone's evacuation. This guard sealed himself in this room, confident that they wouldn't just abandon him. The next entry is from many days later, just saying, so hungry implying that he starved to death when he was abandoned, further implying how desperate the struggle against 0916 was. Though I'm not seeing any water sources, so he probably would have died from thirst before hunger. That said, while this once again is a little bit too tell don't show, it's such an effectively depressing moment. It's funny how this game comes across as so nihilistic, but it's not forcefully nihilistic, because the way this game is set up, the already lost cause nature of the story makes the depressing nature feel more natural given the setup and circumstances, and the writing is top notch. It really gets the sting of effective hopelessness down. It really weighs on you. With that said, there's a bit of a problem with the writing. Most of the guards and personnel's memos are overly verbose and flowery, but that's not really an issue because that's not necessarily unrealistic, aside from them all sounding the same. But throughout the game, you get a look at 1213's internal narration, and him having internal narration to begin with is a bit of an issue, but then when you take a look at them, they are the most flowery and overwritten internal narrations ever, and from a character that has no memory, that's very questionable. What I mean is that 1213 was stabilized at the second stage of the disease, and so the disease had gotten to the point where 1213 was suffering from severe headaches and short-term memory loss, and so by all rights, I can't envision a scenario where somebody under those circumstances would be thinking to themselves in the same way a 14th century bard writes his music. I wish it would have been more visual, like we never actually go into 1213's internal narration, and instead his pain and memory loss is conveyed visually, but that's the limitations of the engine, I suppose. Hell, the mental degradation is so deep-seated that there were points where we literally play as 1213 being trapped in his diseased mind as it closes in on itself, and then later he always comes to in a random place. I can definitely sympathize. At one point even having a heart rate that was quote, insane. Just a guess, but I'm pretty sure that's not the medical term. Well anyways, so after all of that, we end up in the final confrontation. We see the pod that 1213 was created in, and find out that he was a glorified freebie. Ironic. And we see Westbury full on for the first time. He looks like Otacon's slightly less pathetic, but still fucking pathetic brother. He then has 1213 prove his worth by fighting off a giant security droid, only for Petrovic to focus on the cost of the droid. Then Westbury finally fully snaps, and then we get the first F-bomb in the game. <laughs> It's funny how every time Westbury kills someone, it's so anticlimactic, which I think represents his futility. Even though he's crazy, he's still just a tiny, powerless man. He slowly realizes what he's done by killing the main person running the operation, and tries to redeem himself by letting 1213 run free. So after that, you go into the very unrealistic space elevator, and through all of this, there's an underlying mystery that surrounds the entire game. And I'm gonna put a spoiler warning here as to what the big mystery ended up being, but it's a really good twist, so I recommend playing it for yourself. This is your last chance. Alright. 
So as you descend the elevator, Westbury appears on the TV with one eye shot out. Theorize yourself what that represents. And as he lay dying, he apologizes for 1213's existence. After tormenting 1213 out of spite, he finally grows to regret that any of them had to be put through any of this. That 1213 had to be created and had to suffer at all. He then lets you read the memo that Deacon sent the crew. Little by little, the memo is revealed to you in vague terms until you step outside of the elevator and... The entire world is an apocalyptic landscape. Shortly after the cloning operation was started, there was an unclear cataclysm that made Earth completely uninhabitable. The way this message is delivered, the music, the writing, it honestly gave me chills even though I knew it was coming. Even worse is, Petrovic is dead and so is Westbury. Pretty much anyone who could do anything to help has been killed. Even worse, the children managed to get as far as the corridor to the space elevator, so the implication is that the actions of 1213, specifically when he blew up the barricade to the Forbidden Zone, has inadvertently caused the station to be absolutely overrun by the children. Westbury gave you the the gun, Westbury set you free so that you could be the ultimate savior, but that backfired big time. The last hope ended up being the final nail in the coffin. A fittingly nihilistic end to a nihilistic game. That said, there are a few plot holes here. The Tessa Life Station was big enough to have a monorail. It was probably the size of the Black Mesa facility. How did they get it into orbit? Second, there are windows all over the place. Did nobody notice what was going on on Earth, or at least all the lights going off? Third, they have drone technology. If they're running low on supplies and resources, they could have just equipped one of those drones with some sort of remote control and grabbing contraption, went down to Earth and stocked up on the things that they needed that were still there. These are scientists, after all. They could have fashioned something together, but that said, though, I love this ending. I love how the sheer overwhelming nature of this ending is represented by us never getting 1213's perspective on it. It's fantastically executed. That message at the end when he talks about the future being a clean slate and in your hands, talking to his men but could be interpreted as him talking to 1213 himself, is a gut punch. Really gives me chills. And 1213 wanders off with his Swiss cheese memory as what might be the last living creature on Earth. There's also a comedy ending where if you type in a special code at the food court and carry your golden ticket all the way to the end, you get a much more tongue-in-cheek alternate ending where the entire world gets turned into a chocolate wonderland and the children were bred to have metabolism strong enough to survive the new world. Also, Deacon, instead of painting the wall with his brain, decided to take his chances and live a short, indulgent life on the surface, all capped off with Kawaii 1213. Tonally off, but that's the point. It's a joke ending. And that was 1213. My chest still fucking hurts. I think regardless of everything else, this is a horror game, and the measure of a horror game is, what is the emotional response? And if I'm being honest, while I don't find this game consistently scary or tense, there were times when it was really giving me the spooks. And in a game this low res, I think that is a big check plus. The first episode in particular has some really effective moments, so between the story being really effective, if slightly plot holy in the end, and the atmosphere giving me the spooks at times, I think that for what this game sets out to do, it succeeds really well. Sure, the graphics are kinda shite, the gameplay is limited, and the music is stolen, but it all comes back to one thing. Does it succeed in what it sets out to do? And 1213 certainly does. Seeing as it's a freeware game as well, I'd say I got my money's worth. Waka waka. <laughs> if I were ever to get big enough, I would actually love to oversee a movie adaptation for 1213 because, you know, come to think of it, the fact that it's a video game might be one of its detriments. Or maybe I could oversee a upgraded remake. Who knows? But none of that is very likely. However, otherwise, happy Halloween. It feels great to say that. Hall of Weenies. Stay safe and gorge yourself on candy. What am I dressing up as this year? Well, it should be obvious. And I'm his friend Jesus. This video was brought to you in part by my lovely patrons. I thank you for your continued support. If you want to become a patron for TGX, the link is in the description.